Would you pray with me? All of our help is in you, O oh God. Give us the courage to surrender ourselves to that reality. That when we are weak, we don't have to conjure up our own strength. We simply surrender ourselves to you to guide and direct our path, to create within us a new and clean and right spirit, to open our eyes to things that we've not seen before, and to open our hearts to the precious indwelling of your Holy Spirit to guide us each step of the way. So God, as we gather in this place, we pray that you would guide and guard us as we prepare to in a few minutes, leave this place and go back to our homes and our places of assignments, that we may take the spirit that's felt in this room, and it might be a guide and a pathway for us as we strive to live a faithful life and motivate others to do the same. And so God, as now as we confront your word for just a few minutes, we pray that it may come alive to us in special ways. And I would pray a personal prayer that either, in, either through me or in spite of me, you might speak to your church right now. This is my prayer and our prayer in the name of Christ. Amen. When Susan Stiles of Foley, Minnesota was a young mother, she had two little girls. Every night as she tucked her two little girls into bed, Susan would say to them these words, remember, you are special to God. Remember how much I love you. Remember how much God loves you. Sleep loose, my daughters. Sleep loose. Sleep loose? Susan recited these strange sounding directives to her children each night for a very important reason. She wanted her daughters to relax and let go to the love of God that surrounded each of them. She was theologizing with them every night, even as she put them to bed, that God watches out for you and knows all the hairs on your head and the thoughts in your heart. Sleep loose, my daughters. She wanted them to know of the security of God's divine love. I, I know that all of you know this. In fact, most of you feel it. Too many of us these days are sleeping tight. We're tense and anxious and tentative. We're going to bed only to awaken tight and stressed and anxious. The vicious cycle has continued day after day over these last several years. We've wondered what's going to happen next. And something has happened next. And we've grown hesitant and tentative. The vicious cycle continues day after day and stands in the way of our ability to fully open ourselves and receive the presence of God's grace in our midst. But for those, those that know that they are claimed in love and find that assurance every single day, no matter the circumstances, every night brings the comfort and the security of sleeping loose in the Lord. Today's scripture lesson is nothing very profound, neither is this sermon. In fact, it's very simple. It's a simple word. These are Paul's final words to the church in Corinth. Now, you biblical scholars know that the church in Corinth had a lot of troubles. It had a lot of anxieties, it had a lot of internal problems, and it had a lot of external forces that were creating those internal problems. They could not get along, and they were living pretty tight because the Jews did not believe that the Gentiles should hear the gospel message, and they were feeling something that wasn't being authenticated because people didn't want them to receive the grace of God. So Paul said to them, his final words to the church, this troubled church at Corinth, were these. Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Be restored. Listen to my appeal. 
agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss and know that all the saints of God greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. And Paul, who knew he was on a trajectory toward further persecution and death, Paul said those words with great assurance and with faith. Those words demonstrate how a well-crafted goodbye can be a meaningful, moving, and freeing experience before you go. Paul knew about that uncertainty. He knew the reality of an impending execution. And at the very same time, the Korean church was facing this onslaught of external persecution. This was a place that was, as we say, a hot mess. The external forces and the internal strife continued to threaten to blow away their fellowship and their mission. I found the last few years there's a lot that seems to be threatening to blow away our fellowship and our purpose and our drive as called servants of Christ, whether you're baptized or ordained. When Paul shared his final farewell message, it was a simple word that reaches far beyond the moment of its reading. He says to them, finally then, farewell. Farewell also means, may you have a good journey. The journey that Paul envisions is one that travels through life toward the ultimate destination with God. The journey of life for Paul didn't stop at the end of life. The joy that the apostle felt was that he had a firm belief belief that there was something more. And he held on to that as the assurance to be able to live loose in the Lord even beyond this earthly life. Paul's goodbye was like a, a spiritual GPS, a roadmap for their own journey through life and death and into resurrection. In the midst of all the turmoil and all the persecution that this man was facing, Paul advocates for loose living and loose sleeping. Free yourself from the burdens of the world so that you might embrace a power that once it's within you, as he said to the church in Ephesus, once it's within you is able to do within you a a remarkable set of things that are way beyond our dreams and imaginations. It's a prescription for life that reminds the Christian that they are part of a company of people where love and grace and care can be experienced in all of life, but especially in the moments of life when it gets really tough. Today, we gather, and it is a beautiful gathering to see us all together in this place. We gather for a reason to surround these three dear souls with our grace and our love and our support. I I hope that the three of you feel the presence of this community of faith around you. You are loved with a love that will not let you go. You are supported not just by the mentors and those advocates that are directly behind you, but these confirmands and these colleagues and these friends. We gather around them to affirm their calling and bless them on the journey that they'll embark on. And we know, especially those of us who are in similar ordained status, we know that it's a journey that has many uncertainties these days. I found myself saying to the last couple of ordination classes that, you know, I really admire you for saying yes to this mess that you're walking into. I mean, I can't believe it. You're actually going to go through with this. But all joking aside, 
It's a sign of your commitment. And I am blessed by that. Because you have every reason to say no. But with the power of God at work in you, you have said yes. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you for your yes. But there are some things to say. Some important reminders for the journey. And while I talk to these ordinands, maybe the rest of you could listen in for a few minutes. There, there are some comments to be made about this calling thing, this confirmation, and this ordination into, and put it into perspective. And my words to you today are the very same words that Paul gave to the church at Corinth. This is the simple realities, the simple truths of the gospel. Paul said to the church, put things in order and be restored. Today's a day for you and for all of us to, re to remind ourselves of the rhythms and the routines that bring about successful ministry. I've heard people say my entire journey, and at times I've said it myself, I'll work on my spiritual life when I get things in order. Or the other extreme, I'll improve my service to the community when I get my spiritual life in order. As servants of Jesus Christ, when we put our lives in proper order, last things become first things. And now is the time, today is the day, to restore that right relationship with God. This is not just a confirmation day or an ordination day. For all of us, it can and should be a conversion day, a reconversion day, a recommitment to that which we said yes to a long time ago. Today is a moment to remember, a day when that first inkling turned into a calling and that calling today turns into an ordination. These are days that are very challenging for this church in particular, and for organized religion for that matter in general. There are so many things that will tempt us away from a day like today. I'm, I'm so thrilled that you're here. But I wouldn't be honest, you guys, if I didn't say that I worried over you. This is a tough time, a tough time to be a leader of the church. I covenant to pray for you from this day forward because I genuinely worry about you. I want you to be safe. I want you to be committed. I want you to be resolved. I want you to take care of yourselves. We are all in a vulnerable place at this point in our lives. You, you cannot nor will be at your best selves if you're unable to put things into perspective and avoid being burdened by the meaningless priorities that so easily burden you. And they are out there every single day. When I went to seminary back in 1980, and that was, uh, I know, a long time ago, my very traditional grandfather looked at me the day I left to go to Duke Divinity School and said to me, don't let those people take your faith away from you. <laughs> and he meant it. And he was worried about it. As you assume this mantle of ordination and as all of you recommit yourself to the journey of the Christian faith, remind yourself today that this is not the end of the journey. This is not a hoop that the three of you have just jumped through. This is the beginning of a journey that Christ has called you to follow. It's not an accomplishment that you've achieved. It is a moment of real and deep significance. The mantle is falling on your shoulders. It is your time, your opportunity to preserve the gospel message as it has been preserved for centuries and a mantle to adapt as we spread that message in rapidly changing times. That's the dynamic between those historical questions and the world that you walk into, is that how do we take that history and blend it into the future in such a way that it's meaningful and relevant to the people that you reach? And there is, in fact, a way to do that. And we're leaning on you to help us because this is your time. 
This is your moment. Don't let anybody take it away from you. Paul says, listen to my appeal. Now, the most important word in that little verse is that one word, listen. Paul was addressing a church in Corinth that was in utter conflict. And you know that when you're in utter conflict, you can't hear well. They were clouded with self-serving ideas and outside forces of persecution. They just couldn't hear well. Can you relate to that? We cannot hear if we can't be quiet enough to listen, even in the midst of the clamoring voices speaking all around us. Listening frees us from the risk of being consumed by everyone else's opinion. Listening frees us from the risk of thinking that we've got all the answers. Listening opens us up to the wisdom of others and more importantly to the ever-evolving presence of the Spirit in our midst. There is one thing about being assured of yourself and your gifts. That is one thing. But there is another thing about having a healthy sense of self-doubt. Guess what? You are not always right. And guess what? Neither am I. This work places many things in the palm of our hands. It is important in the midst of the many voices that speak and the many opinions that are shared to listen carefully. Listen carefully for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Loosen up, will you? The message of God's love is being spoken. Can you not hear it? Can you not perceive it? And Paul says, sad to say, the default doesn't work. The tendency isn't correct. The temptation has to be avoided. Paul says to the church at Corinth, you know what? We are not just to tolerate one another. Now, I, I, I know that we have relationships that are strained at best and we just have to tolerate one another. Not acceptable. We are called to celebrate one another. Look at this room. We in this room are more the face of Jesus Christ when we are together than when we are apart. We are stronger together. I am stronger because of you. Thanks be to God. God's love is extended to all of us in this room, faults and failures and warts and all. That's why these past few years have been so challenging for us. We have been apart from one another. The natural instincts of who we are and how we operate as a church, the very hallmark of what it means to be the body of Christ and be in relationship with one another has been challenged greatly by our absence from one another. And I hope that you will savor this day. I have a picture in my office. You may have mentioned yesterday about the, the rose petals being dropped from the ceiling. I got a picture in my office standing with the dear St. T. Ann Daniel, who we memorialized yesterday, we were holding our hands up receiving those rose petals. I got that picture on my desk and it'll go with me everywhere I go. But this picture, this picture, this picture, right here, right now, is more glorious than that. Because we have not seen one another's faces. And you look beautiful to me. Instead of criticizing our shortcomings, highlighting the negative, accentuating all the things that we can find fault in one another, and I'll tell you, if you want to find fault in any person in this room, and me included, you will find it. You will find it. But instead of criticizing shortcomings, may we see the good in one another today. May we give one another a chance. 
Might we find a way to disagree in love and demonstrate to the world that there is actually something different about being the body of Christ? Might we do that? Could we do that? When I was in Texas two weeks ago, I was asked to speak to a group. It's a newly formed group in Texas. Now remember, the Texas Annual Conference has lost 53% of their churches. At their executive session, I turned page after page after page of pastors withdrawing from the ministerial office and page after page of churches that departed many of whom to go independent, some of whom to go with the Global Methodist Church. They have formed a group in Texas. Their backs are up against the wall. I mean, we debated last night into the evening about our budget over a couple hundred thousand dollars. They had to reduce their budget by one half. One half. And so their backs are up against the wall. And I was asked to speak to a group that has fondly called themselves Twin, Twinbo that we may be one. It was a group of about 300 people that I spoke to at a breakfast. And I knew a lot of the people in the room and I knew their theological perspectives and I knew their hearts. It was a room of over 300 people who could be described in this way, lay and clergy, conservatives, moderates and liberals. All of them made a conscious decision about how they were going to live together. They saw this opportunity that was placed in front of them to demonstrate to a broken world and a broken church that's known for political division and independent thought that there is a way to live together in a spirit of respect, communication, and love. And that group, after that breakfast meeting, they brought a piece of legislation, get this New Yorkers who love legislation, they brought legislation to the annual conference floor that was about a covenant of how to live together in love, a petition that acknowledged how difficult their life had been in the midst of disaffiliation and how they aspire to do it differently this time. And I'll tell you, there was not a dry eye in that house. Even though they don't agree on all the issues, and my golly, they do not agree on all the issues. They were making a conscious decision and they voted in a piece of legislation that they were going to agree on the commandment to love one another. Might we make the same kind of commitment? We don't have a piece of legislation unless someone were to handwrite it and hand it to me in the next few minutes. But could we not commit ourselves to the same thing? As we go out of this place in a few minutes, could we not just loosen up and see the good in one another? Paul says, Live in peace. Harmony is hard, both internally and externally. Discord is easy. It's a natural tendency that's demonstrated by the world every single day. A true spirit of shalom can easily become a far off goal, but it's one that we, the called ones of Christ, must pursue with daily passion and conviction. Rabbi Harold Kushner once wrote about one day sitting on a bench watching seven children, boys and girls, playing in the sand at the beach. And they were hard at work by the, rivers, by the water's edge. They were building a sand castle and they had all the tools, the shovels and the molds and everything. And just when they were just about finished with their creation, this big wave hit and destroyed it all. Knocked the castle down, knocked the kids over, destroyed their hard work. And the rabbi said that he expected to see the children frustrated or even hurt by the demolishing of their hard work. But instead, the children just ran up from the water, planted themselves in a new place, laughed at their calamity, and held hands together. 
and before he knew what had happened, they were building the sandcastle again. It was then that Rabbi Kushner made a keen observation. He said, all things in life, all the complicated structures are real. We spend so much time and energy creating, but those things we create, they are all built on sand. Only our relationships to one another are the things that will endure. Sooner or later, the wave will come along and knock down what we've built so hard to build up. And when the waves come, and the waves will come, only the person who has somebody's hand to hold will be able to laugh and live. A hand to hold, a life to share together. You guys are going into a world that's got a lot of big waves. And I've noticed these last few, few years how big the waves are and how easily lo those waves distract us from what we are called to do. It's, it's really easy for all of us to go from this place and live on an island, your appointment if you're a pastor. Real easy for you to go and back onto that island. My plea with you today is that you would go from this place holding a hand. We need each other. Trust the hands that you hold, even the ones that you do not even agree with. If they extend a hand to you, might you have the courage to extend yours to them. Loosen up and live in peace with one another. Paul says, receive the gift of love. Richard Allen Farmer, the gifted speaker and preacher, tells the story of his grandfather buying him a small movie projector when he was a kid. Now, some of you in this room, probably the three of you, don't understand what that is. It's a tiny little thing. It has two spools on it, and there's a film that's actually a movie thing that needs to be threaded through these sprockets. And it comes out on the other side, and you hook it in, and you turn it on, and the light comes on, and this movie appears. <laughs> Richard says, my pop taught me how to thread the projector. He partially demonstrated to me how to bend the film around the sprockets and thread it into the movie projector. And after, the, after demonstrating how to do it, Pop said, now you try it. Farmer said that he threaded the film properly in the projective, projector. And then he said, I will never forget Pop's word to me. I have the smartest grandson in the whole world. Years later, Richard asked his Pop if he remembered that day. And Richard said, my pop didn't remember that. But I did. For all the years since then, when I threaded the projector, I thought that I was bright, skillful, teachable, and quick to catch on. I probably would have remembered if, if my pop had said, I have the dumbest grandson in the whole world. And my life would have demonstrated his belief in me. It's just like Susan Stiles with her two daughters. They're probably better able to receive love today because of how they were introduced to love so long ago. We can believe that God is love, but it's far deeper when we come to an understanding that we believe in God's love for us. As you guys prepare for your responsibilities of being an elder and a deacon, think about how you affirm and love rather than criticize and tear down. And hear these words clearly today. You are loved. Period. You will always be 
loved, appreciated, needed, and called. You are important to us. We need you. Loosen up. Loosen up and receive it. Paul said, join the cloud of witnesses. He evoked the presence of all the saints in his farewell to the church in Corinth. A part of the success of the Christian journey is to feel that we're a part of this thing together, friends, the entire community of faith, and prepare to become a part of them. I've been, pl been blessed in my life to have several mentors. I only have one long-standing mentor that remains living. He will get a call from me on the way home today. He remains my motivation. But those mentors that I recall that are long gone, they too remain my motivation because of the way in which they chose to live their lives. I mentioned to you earlier in the week about, the, about grieving the death of my dad. <laughs> dad was a huge Pittsburgh Pirates fan, and the Pirates are playing the Mets this weekend. Pirates won the first one, Mets won last night. I know, I know, it's rubber game today. He and my mom moved to the spring training home of the Pittsburgh Pirates in Bradenton, Florida when they retired because I think my dad actually thought that he could make the Pirates. And they have been so bad lately, I think he could have actually made the team. <laughs> but something's happened to the Pirates this year. They have either been in or hovering near first place all season. And I've heard from a number of people who knew my dad, who were unconnected with one another, who have said to me, my gosh, your dad is really cashing in with the Lord about the Pirates. <laughs> I think he's shining down on them. Well, I don't know about that. But I do know that in the belief system that makes us who we are, we believe in the mysterious presence of the cloud of witnesses who continue to pray for us and with us and encourage us to keep pressing on in our work here on earth. Feel it. Let it drive you. Let it motivate you to goodness and holiness and love. There once was a piano teacher who very intentionally got her students ready for their recitals by saying to them to perfect the endings of their recitals over and over again. And when the students complained about having to practice the end all the time because it got so boring, the teacher would say, you can make a mistake in the beginning or in the middle or in some place along the way, but it'll all be forgotten when you manage to make the end glorious. You will make mistakes. You will fall short. You'll make poor judgments. There'll be things that you wished you wouldn't have said, times when if you had the opportunity, you'd go back and change it. But grow from it all. Learn from it all. Let the grace and love of Jesus forgive you, bless you, and motivate you to move forward and build upon all the experiences that God offers to you to find the sanctified life. There is nowhere in the scriptures where it says, well done, good and perfect servant. But Matthew 25, 23 does say it right. Well done, good and faithful servant. Loosen up. Enjoy the journey. It's too short. Learn from it all. And in the end, celebrate what it means to be joined with the blessed communion of the saints that celebrate your life today, intercede for your life tomorrow, and are waiting to welcome you home when the life journey ends. There once was a tourist who, that visited the old home of a rabbi. The tourist was absolutely amazed to see that the rabbi's house was only a simple room filled with books and a table and a bench. Rabbi asked the tourist, where is your furniture? Where is yours, replied the rabbi. Mine, said the puzzled visitor. Why, sir, I am only a visitor here. I'm just passing through. 
So am I, said the rabbi. So am I. We are just passing through. Today is the day, a day of new beginnings. As we pass through, as we make our way, lighten up, loosen up, and have a little fun. May it be so. Amen. Thank you, Ross. Friends, an elder is called to share in the ministry of Christ in the whole church, to preach and teach the Word of God, and faithfully administer the sacraments of holy baptism and communion, to lead the people of God in worship and prayer, to lead persons to faith in Jesus Christ to exercise pastoral supervision, to order the life of the congregation and the connection, to counsel the troubled and declare the forgiveness of sin, to lead the people of God in obedience to Christ's mission in the world, to seek justice, peace, and freedom for all people, and to take a responsible place in the government of the church and in the service to the community. This is the rule of life and work for an elder. Do the two of you believe that God has called you to the life and work of an elder? I do, I do so, so believe. Amen. Friends, a deacon is called to share in Christ's ministry of servanthood, to relate the life of the community to its service in the world, to lead others into Christian discipleship, to nurture disciples for witness and service to lead in worship, to teach and proclaim God's word, to assist elders and appointed local pastors at holy baptism and holy communion, to interpret to the church the world's hurts and hopes, to serve all people, particularly the poor, the sick, and the oppressed, and to lead Christ's people in ministries of compassion and justice, liberation and reconciliation, especially in the face of hardship and personal sacrifice. This is the rule of life and work of a deacon. Jenna, do you believe that God has called you to the life and work of a deacon? I do so believe. Amen. Friends, as these persons are ordained by the church for the office and work of elders and deacons to which they've been called by the Holy Spirit, let us pray for them. We praise you, eternal God, because you have called us to be a priestly people, offering to you acceptable worship through Jesus Christ our Lord, apostle and high priest, shepherd and bishop of our souls. We thank you that by dying, Christ has overcome death and having ascended into heaven, has poured forth gifts abundantly on your people, making some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, to build up Christ's body, and to fulfill your gracious purpose in the world. Give to these your servants the grace and power they need to serve you in this ministry. Make them faithful pastors, patient teachers, wise counselors. Enable them to serve without reproach, to proclaim the gospel of salvation, to administer the sacraments of the new covenant, and to offer with all your people spiritual sacrifices acceptable to you through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Almighty God, pour upon Jinwoo Kim the Holy Spirit for the office and work of an elder in Christ's Holy Church. Jinwoo Kim, take authority as an elder to preach the word of God, to administer the holy sacraments, and to order the life of the church in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Elder Kim. God bless you. You take him, may Almighty God pour upon you the Holy Spirit for the office and work of an elder in Christ's holy church. Amen. You take him, take authority as an elder to preach the word of God, to administer the holy sacraments, and to order the life of the church in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, as Jenna is ordained by God and the church for the ministry of a deacon, to which we believe that she has been called by the Holy Spirit, may we pray for her. We thank you, living God, that in your great love you sent Jesus Christ to take the form of a servant, becoming obedient even to death on the cross, and now resurrected and exalted in the heavens. You've taught us by his word and example that whoever would be great among us must be servant of all. Give Jenna, this servant, grace to be faithful to her promises, constant in her discipleship, 
and always ready for works of loving service, make her modest and humble, gentle and strong, rooted and grounded in love. Give her a share in the ministry of Jesus Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve. Amen. Almighty God, pour upon Jenna. And